this book. Um, I was sitting around one day and I was uh, jawing with some guitar playing buddies of mine and uh, a couple of guys actually uh, uh, wrote um, just a few books, I think between the two of them they've written maybe 60 books. And I was harping about never being happy with um, any book I'd ever seen for the guys that come to me and want to play, you know, rock. I've, I've seen all kinds of beginner books. I mean, Mel Bay Book One. Um, how long have you seen that thing around? You know? um, and uh, there's tons and tons and tons of uh, books out there on, you know, super advanced things. You know, like Aaron Shearer books for classical guitar or the Berkeley Method for jazz. But um, you get a lot of rock guys that uh, come along and I'll get some 20-somethings and some 30-somethings and guys have been playing since they were like 13, 14, 15 years old. And they know their blues box and maybe they know their major pentatonic. And um, they're sitting there and they maybe have a few more scale shapes and patterns into their fingers and they go, well, when I see the guy on TV and his fingers are flying all over the neck, how do those guys do that? Because I feel like I'm trapped in these shapes and patterns, you know. And the blues box is called the blues box for a reason. You know, it's a four fret little cage. Uh, it works. There's not a bad note in the bunch. It's probably the most used scale for writing and improvisation, period. Um, the reason being, um, every note in the scale is a chord tone. And if it's not a chord tone, it can be bent up to a chord tone or released to a chord tone. So you have your basic chords covered. You have the one in the five, which is our power chord. And then you have the third, if you bent to the perfect fourth. Fourth can be bent to the fifth. It's just not a bad choice. The only thing is, how do I get that box where I can move it all over the place? So normally for the evolution um, of a rock guitar player, you start to delve into the modes, classical scales and jazz scales, seven note scales, diatonic modes. So you have the natural minor scale. So we're in A minor, I think it's probably like the first scale I show you in IntelliShred. And just A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then the same thing again. And a lot of guys, especially rock kids, when we learn a new scale when we're young, uh, first thing we do is we learn how to go up and down it really, really fast and give them a little attitude like, hey, did you hear that? And then three, four months later, it's just not that cool anymore because we're sick and tired of playing it. And we're as tired of playing it as our friends are of hearing it. So again, we're kind of like, we got more notes to choose from, but we're still just stuck in a box. And the only choices we have are either learn a new scale or jump it up an octave 12 frets higher and then that trick gets old and we really don't do anything but just cop licks from other players. We never really get our own identity as a guitar player. So the first thing you want to do is you want to learn how to travel the neck. And uh, I'm going to swap guitars real quick so we can get something with some dots on it so you guys can look at it. I know sometimes I forget I play something like just finding that note one note at a time. And uh, I remember reading a guitar method, uh, it's an interview with a couple of different guys, Steve Morris and uh, Joe Satriani, kind of like a super guitar player's round table, if you will. And just take something like the, the E note. And see how many E's you can find. And then after you get used to finding them a couple of days in a row, Set a metronome to something stupidly slow, like 60 beats a second, so it's more like um, a stopwatch, and try and play one E per click. And so you can play them all from the very lowest note to the very highest note. You know, and think about how many E's you have, your open E, your E power chord, you know, you have the little D form like that that you can move around. So you sit there and my open E blue scale, I know I've got an E there. There's another one. So you start jumping that around in octaves. Just pick them out on one string at a time. And pretty soon you'll know where all the E's are. And then you got one here, one there, and one there, and one way up there. 
and you figure them all out and then you start trying to find maybe all the A's and think about well where is A in relationship to E. The other way to try and figure out the fretboard is to look at things in octaves. So a bar chord, you know, remember everybody like, you know, squeezes till their hands got divots in it, you know, from trying to make a clean bar chord. And in a bar chord, you've got three root notes. You've got one on your first finger on the low E string if you're playing like this A. You got one on your pinky, seventh fret, and then one here again. So if you start looking, you know, kind of that octave shape, the jazz, it's Hendrix kind of octave pattern. So you've got an A there, you've got an A there, two A's there, you know, providing your in tune, you know. Um, and you just start to try and find places on the neck like that. Or you can start finding repeating patterns and shapes. Now, most guitar players look at music and their eyes start to cross. Because we'd just rather have a buddy of ours go, it's right here, dude, and go, okay, and then we're off to the races. Nobody wants to sit down and take the time to actually learn how to read music. You know, it's not, uh, it's not hands-on. You know, you look at that stuff, and it's like uh, sometimes you're looking at something that's explaining a scale or, or theory, and it reads more like VCR instructions than it does actual, oh, well, how's that EVH lit go again? So... Again, we're looking at uh, A minor, that first scale I, I show you. And on the E string and the A string, they have a repeating pattern. A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. And yeah, it's even the same fingering. So they have the repeating pattern. And if I skip that G and I move to the next A, it happens again. And if I find the next A, it happens again. So now I've got... And I've just traveled three octaves in an angular fashion. I'm up high in a new territory that... I'm just like, wow, my hand's actually moving around the neck now. Can I uh, impress myself and scare all the other guitar players and maybe get that cute girl in the front row when I play that gig, you know? So... If you can remember one, three, four. So you've learned how to move that. You've got some mobility here. At the same time, you're learning the neck, the octaves. And you can take just about any scale and find a symmetrical pattern that repeats. The guitar is very visual. A lot of squares and triangles, things like that that fall into... Uh, the geometry, or you could sweep it. And not everybody's a great sweeper, not everybody's going to be a great sweeper, and, and there's so little out there that even actually really shows you how to properly sweep. And it's very hard to do if you're sitting there and, you know, and to get it clean. It's like, you know, it's a magic trick, you know, just to get, get it sounding anything um, musical. So we look at a minor chord. Again, I'm going to use A minor. Uh, a minor's A, C, and E. That's pretty much it. You play that chord, you've got an A, you've got an E, you've got an A, you've got a C, you have an E, you have another A. So we're looking at the one, the minor third, and the fifth. So see, I've got a little triangle pattern there. If you look at those points, you'll see that it forms a triangle. So if I just repeat that pattern starting on every A, you know, sounds very classical. You know, rearrange it and put the C over here, it's still just a triangle. You've just kind of changed the shape. So now it's instead of do that, that's a huge stretch. You're just making it harder on me to have to play that. Um, different finger shapes, different finger patterns will enable you to do different things rhythmically. You know, And that's one thing that's really hard to do with sweeping. You can't always come up with some cool little phrase because usually sweeping, most guitar players use that like a weapon. It's just a barrage of notes. You know, and that's, that's all you get. 
you know, down, up real quick, like some kind of classical violinist, and that's it. That's all you get. It's over with. You can't actually kind of sequence the notes. Whereas, I'll turn this pattern into a descending lick using um, maybe a little hammer on pull off thing. You know, nothing to it. I just used, I did the same thing three times. So again, it's just an A, a C, and an E. And we're not, we're moving that for three octaves. You know, so you're not bound to play all seven notes just because the scale has seven notes in it. And each scale has its own personality. So you, it depends on, you know, it's pretty easy to figure out, you know, whether a song's major or minor. Is it happy or is it sad? Ditto for playing a chord. Is it happy or is it sad? And you've got lots of different scales out there to choose from. You know, just within the confines of the mode, you have four scales that are minor, you have three scales that are major, and depending on what's going on musically, they'll, any of them will work. You know, a lot of them overlap, and they all overlap the blues scale. So learn a few of these positions or patterns and start to mix them up with your stock blues licks that you took from every Clapton record your dad had. And, um, you know, now you're, you're starting to kind of come up with your own, your own sound, your own identity. You're, you're, you're breaking the pattern of just kind of rehashing, you know, over and over and over again. But each, each scale's got a, a little different twist and turn, you know. So we're here in the minor. You know, so we got that going. Now, maybe that sounds a little too classical, and what we need is more, um, we need more of a blues, jazz kind of vibe, you know, something over a minor seven chord. Well, all of those notes, A, C, G, and E, are in that scale, and we're going right up the alphabet. So we're here. I'm going to take this shape. How many guys have played this blues lick? You know, that's one of those first things, you know, that Pat Travers, Ace Freely. I'm going to take some notes out of that. And so I've got a G, I have an A, I have a C, and an E. Very much like playing that blues lick. Move that to three octaves. Now I've just done a very jazz thing and outlined the chord for a beta. Nice little lick there on the end, and wow, it doesn't sound like any stock lick I've played before. And you can use that. You know, so right there it's just a little box. Again, we talked about everything's boxes or triangles, right? Um, I can take this and I'll leave out the fifth. We play the power chords anyway. Um, I'll just play the A, the C, and the G. So you see, it makes a triangle. I'm just going to take that, and uh, this is very slippery. This lets you shift very easily. And then you get the G way up high. Yeah. It's a nice little lick there. You throw a stock of... You know, suddenly you're playing minor seven bass. Jazz. And that can also come from the Dorian scale. The Dorian scale's got the same notes in it as a minor scale except for the sixth. The sixth, instead of being here, it's here. Which is that note that you get when you guys go. It's just here. So, you know, a lot of stuff.
substitutions are exact same scale, one fret difference. So a lot of these licks that you guys hear modern players play, and even not so modern players play, a lot of it is crossing these things, um, minor scales with the minor pentatonic or the blues scale, creating these hybrid runs. And they may not always be musically correct, but the thing is, the rules are, especially when it comes to electric guitar, the rules are there are no rules. You know, you go to college, you take music theory, it's called music theory, it's not called musical absolutes. You know, it's somebody's formulaic idea of how things work. And they work, but you're not always bound to them. You know, you can, you can get out there. The main thing when it comes to that kind of stuff is just trust your ear. If it sounds right to you, then it's right. It doesn't matter what the next guy says. I mean, I don't like that. Well, it doesn't matter. Don't play it. You know, I'm playing it. You don't have to play it. You know, always trust your ears. You know, when you trust your ears, you're trusting yourself. You know, it's, it's a more natural phrasing. It's a more natural lick. And when you feel that way about something, it gives you a, a conviction. And you play and you just strike the strings differently because you believe in it. And if you believe in it, then it comes off as being genuine, and people will buy it. You know, they'll take it, whether it's musically correct or not. You know, it's, there's just something when a player whacks the strings a certain way when he really believes in what he's playing, versus like, well, oh, this kind of sort of works. Harmonics. The only one I know is where you choke up on the pick a whole lot and then hit the... Yeah, that's got to be one of the most frustrating things for any guitar player to ever learn. And I wish, this is one of those things, maybe I should put that in the next book. Um, first thing you want to do is usually, as a rule, uh, have your bridge pick up on, and uh, you want to be slamming the amp with a lot of gain and a lot of signal. And like you said, you're going to choke way up on your pick. Now, I don't know if everybody can see that. Probably not, because I can barely see it, and I'm sitting right here in front of my own hand. Um, when I play, I'm extremely choked up on the pick. There's just the smallest amount of the tip that I play with. And I kind of equivocate that to when you're a guy and your dad takes you out in the backyard and teaches you how to swing a bat for the first time. Most of us were at the age where the bat was bigger than we were. And what's the old man tell you, you know, when, you know, choke up on the bat? You know, well, you're, you're, you're more in control. I see a lot of guys play back here and they want to know why they go through so many strings. And the strings wear out or they break a lot of strings. When you have that much pick sticking out, that's that much surface that's resisting and just digging into the strings. And I don't care how heavy, you can play with 13s. And the, the string's just not built to take a pounding like that. Most people play too hard, um, you know, right and left hand. Most people squeeze the neck too hard. So if you're choked up, the string is only getting grazed across the face by the pick. You're more in control. And, um, you know, I never get my pick dug down in the string. So it's really always just going to, whether I'm picking or grabbing a harmonic or anything, uh, it's just, it's like when someone gives you a baby kitten and you scratch its head. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's a really light controlled movement and stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually, for the pinch harmonic, I can remember driving my mother crazy in the back room with the distortion pedal crank and the amp crank. And I'm in her bedroom because it was the farthest thing away from like my old man and the television set. And you know, after like two hours of you know, doing this, stop already. Um, but what you want to do is, I wish somebody would take a picture of this, get a really small camera. And um, what you're going to do is even when you choke up on the pick, there's like a little notch there between the side of your thumb and the string. And what you're going to do is you're actually going to place the pick and the fleshy side of your finger, your thumb, on the string at the same time. Now I'm playing it just a plain old D. Old 70s players like Billy Gibbons made that famous, and it's just he had he used a really heavy pick and had such a hard right hand that he'd do entire descending rounds. You know. 
such a heavy right hand um, that he would just he would do it and then it just kind of called Thank you. 